Um, I was asked to talk on this title, but I'm going to delete the first part, benefits of vitamin D, because I have a feeling you've uh, heard that for most part of the day. You know, if you're talking about the risks of toxicity of vitamin D, the first thing you have to think about is the context of the dose that you're discussing. And, you know, way back in 1977, TCB Stamp published in The Lancet a beautiful article where they were comparing the rise in 25-hydroxy-D that was achieved by sending UK people to suntan parlors compared with taking various doses of vitamin D. And guess what? The rise in 25-hydroxy-D paralleled whether they were going to a suntan parlor or taking 10,000 units of vitamin D daily. And recognize, you know, you and I are a human species. We're the primate species. We evolved near the equator as nudists. Nature effectively optimized our biology for the environment in which we arose. We arose in an environment that was acclimatized to 10,000 units. So I would argue from a biological principle, 10,000 units should be regarded as safe because it's the human starting point. Um, much of what you heard today was discussion about the question, well, what if I only had a couple of percent, a few percentage points of this kind of a dose, 10,000 units per day, and you saw maybe there's some health relationships. But if you ask the question, why is vitamin D toxic, there's a uh, you know, an older scientist named Periclesius, who some years ago wrote something along the lines of, if it actually works, if it actually works. In other words, there's a compliment built into toxicity. By saying it's toxic, you're acknowledging that it's potent and effective. But at the same time, what you're acknowledging is if you take too much, there will be a, a risk or a consequence of that. This is a slide that was uh, provided by one of the members of the Institutes of Medicine Committee. You're probably aware that on November 30th, 2010, they, they released new dietary guidelines in North America. And this is the logic of that 14-member committee. And I'm going to start off, essentially, with the first part. They call it acute toxicity, or they claim that above 250 nanomoles per liter of 25-hydroxy-D, uh, strangely enough, uh, they, they use two kinds of units, uh, nanomoles per liter here and nanograms per milliliter here. This represents uh, 500 nanomoles per liter. Um, so th I wanted to look at the safety and toxicity of vitamin D from three different angles. Ten years ago when my colleague was looking at this sort of thing as a member of an Institute of Medicine committee, the criterion was, is, is vitamin D causing hypercalcemia? Are you raising the blood calcium? That's the old definition, and I just sort of want to walk through that a little bit. In 1948, there was a beautiful um, collection of case reports published, 1948. And recognize, you know, we've known for many years that vitamin D is toxic. This is old knowledge, but what I want to point out here is the context of the dose associated with toxicity. It's, it's a longer paper. You're probably welcome to get it from the library. You can see the symptoms. Vitamin D causes hypercalcemia. Hypercalcemia, whether it's due to cancer or to hyperparathyroidism or to vitamin D, causes a number of things. Basically, it dehydrates you, it causes thirst, anorexia, vomiting, constipation, etc. You're dehydrated. You have renal failure due to lack of water, and the doses that can cause that start off at a minimum of 46,000 units per day, and if you go down the list of the doses here, you know, most of them are in the thousands of units of kilogram body weight of the individual before they're starting to, to show doses, and so I find this quite a, an enlightening paper because it gives you the real context of where this phobia of vitamin D came from. We published a couple of years ago um, a case where uh, actually a 29-year-old young guy, he didn't know it at the time, was being literally poisoned by his girlfriend who had crystalline vitamin D, which, by the way, it looks just like table sugar. So they put crystalline, when they had an argument, she put crystalline vitamin D into his table sugar. <laughs> there was detective work, literal detective work, to find out it was the table sugar that contained it. Um, he went to the hospital. 
These are his symptoms. They were diagnosed initially in emergency as gastroenteritis, get, go home, you'll feel better in a few days. His father eventually showed up with the same kind of symptoms and they measured the father's calcium. These are in SI units. That works out to about 15 milligrams per deciliter calcium. Um, 25 hydroxy D was measured because the PTH was not high enough to account for that. It was 1,500 nanomoles per liter. And the sun's was even higher. We did HPLC normally with a liquid chromatograph. You can see the classic spectrum of 25 hydroxy D. It looks small here, but it's because it's dwarfed by unmetabolized vitamin D that was abundant so much in their system it couldn't get metabolized. It was present at 25,000 nanomoles per liter. These guys were really intoxicated with vitamin D. And you know the end of the story about a year later? Was he still going out with the girl? <laughs> he was. He survived. <laughs> um, so with regard to vitamin D, what I want to walk through you is the canary in the mine. You know, what's the first thing that's going to go wrong? If you were to progressively keep taking more and more vitamin D, where are you going to see the problem first? Well, Recognize in an adult, you or I, we absorb calcium through our intestine. Our bones are in equilibrium with regard to calcium. We don't put more calcium into the bones. They're roughly the same. So if you absorb calcium better, you buy a super calcium supplement for better absorption, where is it going to go? Into your urine. So if you absorb calcium better, you've become vitamin D intoxicated, you're absorbing too much calcium, what are you going to see first? Hypercalciuria. The kidney is the safety overflow valve for calcium. And eventually, when the kidney can't handle it anymore, you will develop hypercalcemia and the symptoms shown earlier. So urine calcium is the canary in the mine. And, and urine calcium, by the way, is a reasonably good substitute for efficiency of calcium absorption from the food. Because where does the food calcium go if you absorb it? It goes into your urine. Some years ago, Robert Haney presented this a uh, collection of data that indicated, yes, indeed, as you get more and more vitamin D into your body, calcium absorption goes up, but it hits a plateau, a flat area where the regulation of calcium absorption works quite well. Now, we don't know what happens if you keep going up and up off of this curve, but I have a little bit of evidence for you. We recently published what I would describe as a phase one. You know how drug studies work? Before, if you invent a new drug, you have to go through a phase one study. Keep giving higher doses, your drug's safe. Phase two, you know, can you see any other efficacy? What's this new drug do? So treating plain old colocalciferol as if it were a drug, we did a phase one dose escalation study. This was recently published last May in, in neurology. Now throughout this study, 1,200 milligrams of elemental calcium was provided consistently. So we started off with, um, 25-hydroxy-D, which, by the way, these were multiple sclerosis patients. They started off with 25-hydroxy-D that were averaging about 75 nanomoles per liter already. And you can see these are box plot data, 75th percentile, 25th percentile. A week on the, uh, sorry, it's a couple of weeks on calcium, no change. So this is 4,000 units per day for a month. That equals uh, 100 micrograms. We're, we're talking microgram units here. If they were still healthy, they went on a doubling of the dose to 8,000 units per day for a month. If it was still okay, 16,000 per day, 32,000 per day. And then the final month, this was a total of about a six-month dose escalation protocol. Its intent is to see at what point does the higher serum 25 hydroxy D elicit harm. We're looking intentionally for harm. And it was actually kind of frightening to do this because we're looking for a problem, but we're monitoring the patient so closely that we can stop. The uh, line that you see here is the highest level that you would see in healthy people if you just did a survey of people working outdoors, farmers, your ancestors, who did not take vitamin D supplements. And these are the results at the top. You see the calcium to creatinine ratio in the urine, which is a good measure of 24-hour <coughs> urine calcium. At the bottom are the average 25-hydroxy-D levels. So as you can see, by the end of the study, the average patient had a d level that was double the top of our physiologic range. Um, urine calcium would be classified in mole per mole hypercalciuria at a ratio of about one. You can see how the urine calcium changed over the course of the months of giving this treatment. And serum calcium, again, couldn't see anything. On averages, overall, you can't see anything. But I just want to show you this figure. 
It is the same data as the urine, but what we've done is broken every patient into a point. We're looking at the urine calciums over here, and I, I did this talk in the United States, so I changed the units, but this is one millimole per millimole, or 38 milligrams per milligram. And it's following Robert Heaney's style of graph. Remember, 25-hydroxy-D rises initially. As you increase the vitamin D content, you increase absorption. Here, the surrogate is urinary calcium. From an, about 80 nanomoles per liter on up to about 225 nanomoles per liter, there was a statistical flat period, which says you've got enough vitamin D to regulate calcium absorption quite well. And then finally, just the slightest hint of hypercalciuria starts at about 225 to 250 nanomoles per liter. This is the canary in the mine. These patients were still safe, but there's a start where the vitamin D is driving calcium absorption. So that related to the acute toxicity of the story that the Institutes of Medicine was concerned about. In other words, you can easily go past 10,000 units of vitamin D and on a reasonably long-term basis and, and not observe the classic hypercalcemia. The next question. I heard a lot of talk actually from Carol and some of you that you, know, you should have levels higher than 100 nanomoles per liter. They seem to be healthy. Well, if you read this 1,000-page book that the Institutes of Medicine in the United States put out, they say you should not have more than 125 nanomoles per liter because at that point you see what they call emerging evidence of adversity, emerging evidence of harm, and there is some. I, I heard some questions earlier, you know, why don't these government people understand all this enlightened stuff that you've been watching today? And I, I have to say they do have some justified concerns if they are not that knowledgeable and just sort of look at things superficially. So what I want to walk you through are some of their scare stories and give you at least my perspective of it. So why would they say 125 nanomoles per liter or higher? Well, it turned out that uh, there was a nice study published in the middle of last year uh, from New Zealand where 500,000 units of vitamin D was given once a year. Remember the Richard Dahl, what, what Oliver was talking about? They had uh, done a nice study showing that 100,000 units of vitamin D in the UK, um, given once every four months, reduced falls and fractures. Well, in New Zealand, they decided to go them one better. Why give it every four months? We're going to give 500,000 units once a year, because after all, all we want to do is keep the vitamin D levels up. Well, unfortunately, the result they got was the total opposite of what Trevetti and Dahl had uncovered in the UK. They found that during the first three months after fractures, this is a, a four-year clinical trial of a couple of thousand people, falls and fractures went up in the vitamin D arm compared to placebo. Now, at what blood level did this happen? And if you look at this graph, these are the blood levels. They gave vitamin D annually, and then, well, firstly, they started off at a level that wasn't too bad, higher than in the UK anyway, and they went up to 125 nanomoles per liter and then declined in annual cycles like this. And by the way, they said, well, we had reasonable doses because the levels were higher than 75 nanomoles per liter. That should be wonderful. We've done nice things for these people. Well, what happened? They had higher rates of falls and fractures, and they happened specifically during the first three months after each dose, when they looked at it. So during each dose interval, they had a defined period of greater rate, rates of falls. How can this happen, they say? Well, it's sort of an anomaly. It's not entirely a surprise. Um, <clears throat> around the same time, this nice study from Italy came by where they gave 600,000 units of vitamin D in, in people and followed them not starting a month or two later. I mean, if I give you a big, 500 unit dose of vitamin D today, what's going to be more important? What happens to you tomorrow, the day after, or a week later? Or is it a month or three months from now, the way the New Zealanders studied it? The important thing when you give a bolus acute dose are the responses that happen right away. And, and here you can see the changes in serum 25 hydroxy D during the days after giving the dose. You get a big jump in vitamin D. And if I overlay the Italian data on top of the New Zealand graphs, here's what you see. You get once every year, you shock the body with a dose of vitamin D. The next year, you do it again. 
and then the next year you do it again. So what I'm getting at is here, the shock to the system is not 125 nanomoles per liter, the way the Institutes of Medicine says. The shock to the system is the huge transient in the 25 hydroxy D level. One thing that vitamin D does, it induces its own breakdown. There is an enzyme called CYP24 or 24 hydroxylase that turns on, and within the cell, it clears out the 125 dihydroxy D. Basically, what I'm saying is, if you trick the body into turning on the breakdown enzyme within tissues, then those tissues will be in a relatively vitamin D deprived state, even though the blood vitamin D level may appear to be enough. If the vitamin D gets into the cell, it'll break down more readily, and it did that during those months. By the way, New Zealand, same place. What have we known for years? Well, we've known for a long time that falls and fractures cycle on an annual basis in New Zealand. It's not because of ice and snow like it would be where I come from. Hip fractures happen. And if you overlay the 25 hydroxy D levels in New Zealand, you can see that rising and falling 25 hydroxy D levels are associated with greater falls and fractures. If you artificially amplify those cycles in vitamin D, then of course you will amplify the rates of falls and fractures. So what I'm getting at is that 125 nanomoles per liter that was focused on and basically scaring you away from, 125 nanomoles per liter was an artificial situation not analogous to any kind of treatment. So again, with regard to um, musculoskeletal health, the Institutes of Medicine claims, and quite openly, that 125 nanomoles per liter was bad, but it's because of annual doses. Is there a, if you had a headache, if you're prone to headaches or allergies, does it make sense to you to take all of your pills once a year? <laughs> but we do this with vitamin D for irrational reasons. The basic pharmacology, if you discovered a new drug for any disease, the first thing somebody's going to ask is, how often do I have to take these pills? What's the dose going to be? How often do I have to take it? And the rule of thumb, if you open the pharmacology books as a medical undergraduate, one of the first chapters is the default dosing interval is the half-life of the drug. What's the half-life for vitamin D in your body? If you joined the Navy, and they've published this, and the Brit you joined the UK British Navy, they go into the submarine mission for 60 days, your 25 hydroxy D falls by about a half. Same in the American Navy, same for immigrants, same for vitamin D toxicity. The half-life for 25 hydroxy D is about 60 days. So if you ask yourself, what should my dosing interval be? Well, the dosing interval is um, approximately the half-life. This is from one of the introductory chapters. It takes also, by the way, four half-lives four half-lives before your drug is at its plateau level. So if I started on 1,000 units today, when do I have to look at my plateau level? Six to eight months from now. Um, this also gives a bit of guidance, you know. Um, if you give a drug once a year, what are you doing? Well, you're giving it at an interval of about four half-lives, four to six half-lives. You're giving a drug in what drug studies is called a a washout period. In other words, in New Zealand, they gave the drug at the washout interval. If you were designing a professional clinical trial using such a protocol, no pharmacokineticist would endorse the New Zealand type of protocol, yet they did it for some reason. Um, I've heard a little bit of talk about loading doses and how do you, you know, get the patient up to the loading dose quickly. And basically, a loading dose is a dose that fills the body's compartment. Think about your body as a bucket, and you're putting drug or vitamin D into it, and what you'd like to do is get the level up to where you want it pretty quickly. How do you know what that loading level is? Well, in theory, it should be the volume of distribution in the body. But nobody knows what the volume of distribution is for vitamin D. If I weigh, you know, 70 kilograms, what's my volume of distribution? The problem is, it's difficult. I'm still making vitamin D. I'm eating it. I've got actually multiple compartments. Vitamin D stores into muscle tissue, adipose tissue, you name it. There's a different way of calculating the loading dose. It's analogous again. And here's it. If you think that your patient requires 1,000 units of vitamin D on a long-term basis, 
then the loading dose would be approximately 60 to 90,000 units of vitamin D. In other words, the loading dose is the cumulative steady state dose given during one half-life. In other words, a half-life is 60 days. The loading dose is 60 times your maintenance dose. Um, con continuing on with regard to the safety of vitamin D, the other thing, and, and I noticed one or two uh, speakers alluding to it earlier, were the thing that seems to scare policymakers, is U-shaped risk curves, as they're called. And, I just want to describe what they are. The first time I really clearly became aware of it was in 2004 by um, Tuohima et al., who published a case control study from Finland and Norway and Sweden, um, combining patients with prostate cancer and baseline 25-hydroxys versus those without. And they showed uh, changes in risk for prostate cancer, basically showing um, in those countries, as you have very low vitamin D levels, prostate cancer risk goes up. But likewise, as you have higher blood vitamin D levels, prostate cancer risk goes up. As you can see, that's clearly a U. And I sat there, I, this one really bothered me, because this is statistically significant. I mean, it was not a glitch of an observation. So you kind of think, well, let's see, the, the Scandinavian countries have the highest rates of prostate cancer in the world. Does it make sense to you that the average vitamin D level in the highest risk countries is the best level to have? And that as you go higher, you're gonna increase risk? It didn't make sense. And there's something going on in this story and I wanna walk into it. So what I effectively have done was take what I consider these highest two quartiles and did the difference in risk in the highest quartiles or quintiles in various epidemiologic studies. Okay, there, there was a hypothesis that I proposed some time before, and I'll get to it in a moment. N. Haynes, National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in the United States, showed something comparable but interesting. In the northern part of the United States, where um, ultraviolet light levels were relatively low, there was apparently a higher rate of pancreatic cancer um, with higher 25-hydroxy-D, but in the south, southern part of the U.S. with higher UV levels, again, pancreatic cancer was, was less. Like, this is complicated to understand. In the south, in theory, they have higher blood vitamin D levels than they would in the north. But strangely, in the north, you've got this higher rate of pancreatic cancer. How, how can this be? And it's those U-shaped risks that scare the institutes of medicine. What I've drawn across the top here are two papers, one of them, uh, two figures from the Institutes of Medicine guidelines. And like I said, they're phobic of what's called U-shaped risk curves. And these are all the same data. What they did was apply various statistical models to it, adjusting for age, uh, sickness, uh, dietary intake, smoking, etc. And they see in some situations little hooks. They call them U-shaped risk curves, viscer is another one. They've taken various data, manipulated, and then on occasion they see U-shaped risk. A couple of problems with these things. Firstly, the higher you go in the 25-hydroxy-D levels, the less people there are. With less numbers, you have greater uncertainty. When you do statistics, if you have weak numbers, you have more noise, and you will get things going in the direction you don't want them to go on occasion. The Melamed paper is here. The one paper that was kind of interesting is Michelson over here where, although you can't see it, there was a 95% certainty limit around this and it just bleeped up above one and they say, well, this is very important. We shouldn't go very high in our vitamin D levels. I wanna walk you through at least my hypothesis as to why U-shaped risks may happen. I want to point out melamed, this one where it was statistically significant, was from Scandinavian countries. Um, the hypothesis basically says U-shaped risk curves um, happen, firstly, if you have annual cycles of vitamin D, like if you annually fluctuate, rising up and down. It says that um, it'll happen in regions where you have large seasonal fluctuations in ultraviolet light B. 
Um, and the mechanism, like I indicated, involves the CYP24 enzyme. Vitamin D is a system that has to regulate itself. It's not like a cholesterol-derived hormone. Estrogen, testosterone, etc. no matter how much your cholesterol is, you're going to work them fine. But vitamin D has a substrate that's extremely low in concentration, and it's tricky to understand because it functions with what in some chemists would call first-order reaction kinetics. Your body has to adapt to how much vitamin D you have. So I uh, you know, published this in 2004, this fluctuation hypothesis. And I published it again when I put, wrote my uh, pharmacology chapter in Feldman's Principles of uh, the, the Vitamin D book. I published it again um, in uh, Donald Trump's book, and I published it again uh, in Anti-Cancer Research 2009, if you want to see a full explanation there. And I published it again in an as yet uh, outcoming book, the next edition of Feldman. In other words, this is not something that is new to me. This is something that I've been proposing for seven years, and I have to say that. Why? Because when you develop a hypothesis, it has to explain a system and then predict future results. And I had indicated in 2004, U-shaped risk curves should happen at high latitudes, not low latitudes. And furthermore, I also stated, if you really wanted to test this, what you'd do is use large pulse doses of vitamin D, but that should be unethical. Well, the New Zealanders did this unethical thing for me, and I feel at least one part of the hypothesis is proven, predicted. I didn't know that they would be doing that. So what does latitude do? And here's, if I have a critique of the sun-loving approach to solving the vitamin D problem. It is that where I live and where you live, it does not work for most of the year. And here's what you see at the top. This is uh, beautiful uh, data from an Australian, Kimlin. And what it's showing on the y-axis is the amount of ultraviolet light that you get you know, during the middle of each day that's capable of generating vitamin D. And here at the equator, you have two summers, and you always have high vitamin D levels at uh, 40 degrees north latitude, which is where, south of where most of us live, including Mike, he's at 42 degrees north latitude. You have a vitamin D winter. Okay, so what we've got is something first. You and I are designed to live up at the top curve. Our vitamin D status, if it's fluctuating, fluctuates like that. We've got something else going on, and I was trying to, you know, that's why I asked Bill Grant the question. Because in Europe, Scandinavians have higher blood vitamin D levels than Italians and Greeks. How can it be that the vitamin D hypothesis works? You know, how, can it, how could it work? It works like this. The adversity is not simply your blood vitamin D level. The adversity is how it fluctuates. Unsteady vitamin D levels are as bad as low levels. So again, you know, essentially we're designed to have 25 hydroxy Ds closer to 150. I have measured lifeguards in Toronto and even though they have a two month summer job, even though they're told and wear sunscreen, even though they're told to stand under an umbrella, they start with 60 in May. By the end of August with a two month summer job and my daughters were some of the people in this, even where, though you wear sunscreen, what do you do? It may block some light, but you're allowed to stay out in the light longer. Have you ever seen a a pale lifeguard, it doesn't happen. Even though they put on sunscreen, they get a suntan. Sunscreen allows you to stay out in the sun longer. So if you're living in Finland and you're indoorsy and you have a low vitamin D, that's where your level is gonna be and it'll be relatively stable. But if you're a Finn who has the highest blood vitamin D, the man with the higher rate of prostate cancer, what's he doing? He's outside. The higher your 25-hydroxy-D, even in January, the higher it would have been in summer. The higher it is in summer, the bigger the seasonal amplitude fluctuation is. Where's the proof for this? Well, what I did was take the data that the Institutes of Medicine published on November, <coughs> November 30th, um, 2010. I took the Institutes of Medicine numbers about prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer and put them together and basically did a slope comparison and correlated it with latitude. So in other words, I graphed 
the difference in risk from the two highest quartiles or quintiles versus the latitude that people came from. For example, the graph I showed you earlier with regard to the two Ohima data, the, the delta that you got up there is down here. As you can see, there is a relationship, and especially if you do a weighting for sample size, there's a statistical relationship between U-shaped risk curves and latitude. So here's my problem. If you advise people in the UK to go into the sun during the summertime, what you're effectively doing is committing them for a large dynamic fall in 25 hydroxy. One thing I would have liked to have heard earlier, how much sunshine do you need in order to make vitamin D? If I go out you know, in February, no matter where I am, during two o'clock in the afternoon, am I gonna make vitamin D? No, the rule of thumb is the UV index has to be at least three or higher, and you can see when the UV index is three. Your shadow is the same length as you are. If you wanna make vitamin D in your skin, look at your shadow. If it's shorter than your height, you can make it. You don't have to worry about what time of day it is or what time of year, look at your shadow. And for most of the year, or a good several months of the year, feels like most, your shadow is pretty long and it'll never get shorter than you. So this is my closing slide, and I, I've seen this one before at the top right. This, um, over here, it summarizes the intake of vitamin D, okay, 400 units, 4,000 units, 40,000 units, etc. I published this in 2009, uh, no, sorry, 1999, the last century. Um, the X's are the case reports for vitamin D toxicity. The amount of vitamin D that you get from sunshine is about 10,000 units per day. The new upper level, some people call it the upper limit. You know what the upper level is? It's the dose that anybody in the general public can take without a doctor's supervision and be guaranteed by the governments of Canada and the United States that it'll be safe. It's not the upper limit, it's a safe number. But anyway, the conclusions are basically with regard to safety or toxicity. Normal levels are between 75 and 225 nanomoles per liter without a supplement. And they're safe because we're designed to be this. We're a primate species, and those are the numbers you'd want your normal monkey to have. And furthermore, there's no risk of 4,000 units per day. It's got a wide safety margin, although I'm not advocating more than 4,000. Recognize if I'm asked to talk about vitamin D safety, these are the numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reinhold. So, any, any questions and comments? Um, my comment was a friend of mine has actually um, had her, uh, her blood test perforated, levels tested quite a lot, and she found that um, every time she went on holiday to somewhere hot and had it taken when she came back, it was always much lower. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> in the um, week after, in, say, the, week, the time after she came is, back. Is she the same skin color you are? Yes. <laughs> um, does she lie on the beach? Um, very much doubt it. <laughs> uh, you know, there was a pediatrician from Nigeria who visited me. Um, you know, she's worried about rickets and the like, and I said, I bet you've got a low vitamin D. From Nigeria, at the equator, it was 17 nanomoles per liter. In other words, it's not just enough to go where it's sunny. You actually have to expose skin. And I would argue that you know, the original human beings were nudists you know, near those places. And if you don't open your skin up to, this is a factory. Right now, 95% of it is closed. All right, so if it's lower, firstly, vitamin D tests vary a lot. The variability from one result to the next can easily be 20%. With, a, with no true change in the number. So, in other words, a single case report doesn't tell you a lot, numbers bounce around. Um, and if you don't go into the sun, no matter where you are, you're not gonna change anything. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I'm slightly confused about what the best advice would be to give to people here in, in this northern region in order to avoid the fluctuation. Um, uh, uh, th th that's one question, and the second question is, uh, Dr. John Cannell uh, recommends that, uh, or, or suggests that if you have a cold or flu, or uh, that you might uh, take a big dose of, um, of, of vitamin D, and that might uh, help to uh, uh, drive it away. Um, 
Uh, and it seems to me that with the fluctuation uh, information that you have, that that might actually be working against you. Uh, could you comment on both those things? Uh, number one, I think it's very difficult. Like, there's no science that offers super, su super solutions. I guess one of them is, you know, if you're going to take vitamin D and you're waffling, you know, 50-50, take it during the 50% of the year that's darker. In other words, you know, if you don't want to take vitamin D for a while, don't take it in the summer, but take it during the winter. The other thing is there's no placebo-controlled clinical trial I've ever seen that goes on again, off again. But if you steadily, all year, take more vitamin D, that sine wave will be diminished. The, in other words, if your blood vitamin D has a 20 nanomole per liter amplitude, that 20 nanomole per liter amplitude means less if your average is 150 than if it is 50. So supplementation, like Best Austin Hughes had a nice study, I wish I could have incorporated that. One could do a talk on seasonality of vitamin D. And um, she showed that bone density fell during the winter months, stayed flat during the summer, declined. And when they gave a vitamin D supplement of 800 units, 700 units, bone density stayed straight on through. In other words, the people who say you should be afraid of 125 nanomoles per liter, the people who say, look at these scary U-shaped risk curves, if my hypothesis is true, and I, I'll, I'm wagering my life it is, <laughs> um, if seasonality makes a difference by telling people not to take vitamin D, you're actually contributing to the very U-shaped risk curves that they want people to avoid. The solution to them is to take a supplement, not to avoid vitamin D. Now, yeah, I, okay, I, I, I'm happy with getting vitamin D in summer through sunshine. I love doing that. There's a beautiful paper from some dermatologists, uh, Friedman, that tested people with UV tanning parlors, and they concluded that even though you can't see what color light it is, if it has UV in it, your endorphins will go up. So that there's a reason for endorphins to change, because it's something healthy. Vitamin D, you're not going to notice it minute to minute, but your body has to signal to you that this is healthy. So. It, yeah, tanning's great, but take a supplement, perhaps more of your supplement during the winter than the summer. Your second question about the acute uh, John Cannell. Now, if, in some ways I tend to agree. I, nobody's done the trial that he suggests. There's reasonable evidence. There's a beautiful um, um, RCT, placebo-controlled trial from Japan with regard to influenza in children and 1,100 units for you know, improving it. So if you give an acute several thousand unit dose, you're acutely going to build up your vitamin D system more. Okay, so, and, and then, you know, you, you may have payback time later, but the time I care about my influenza is while I've got it. You know, I'm not going to be worried about it two weeks from now or months from now. And furthermore, if you maintain a dose, it's okay to do occasional bolus doses. Remember, vitamin D has a two-month half-life, okay? So I can give vitamin D at two-month intervals. If I took 60,000 units today, I would think nothing of it, okay? I'll take another 60,000 two months from now. If you take 5,000, or how many did you say? 50,000. Um, it's not, yeah, it's inconsequential. I'm just fascinated by your um, hypothesis that the fluctuation in vitamin D is probably as bad as low level. And, and I think in some respects that's a really quite um, a strong assertion as well. Looking at it from the IOM's point of view, do, do, you, do you kind of believe that they are assessing the data and you're also assessing the data from your perspective and currently um, there isn't proof that the fluctuation is actually causing or, or, or is actually worse uh, than, than the sustained level. Do you think that the, the burden of proof is actually to demonstrate that rather than to take that as, as the, the standard? Um, I guess it's a couple of questions that are, like, all I'm doing is laying out hypotheses. Like I've been working on vitamin D since the 70s. Um, the enzymology is something that was my degree and what I, you know, I, nobody knows more about the kinetics of the vitamin D enzymes than I. Some of the aspects, don't, but the kinetics are first order reaction and there is an adaptation that has to happen. The, un the concepts for it are more understand understood by engineers than by biochemists and nutritionists. Um, so, and I also know that 24-hydroxylase, when you induce it, does not clear or turn off quickly. It stays in your body. 
Cancers tend to have higher 24-hydroxylase levels. 24-hydroxylase has been described as an oncogene because it's thought to break down. In other words, the whole story fits. The data are fitting the way I had predicted, and I haven't published it yet, but it's in the process. Um, okay, so it's what I describe as a sophisticated, hard to understand hypothesis. Okay. Now, with regard to the IOM, they looked at it in the, I would um, interpret, you had a friend um, who, who was on the committee, you were saying, but maybe you haven't talked to him about their logic. Um, but it appears from my reading that they looked at it in the absolute most conservative manner possible, and no sophistication in terms of their looking, unless it was to seek adversity. In other words, if they saw something bad happen with 125 nanomoles per liter, that's what they saw. They basically looked at everything with a snapshot. And if anything, it had a filtered lens that was looking for bad things and not good. That said, like I'm on a panel with <clears throat> Health Canada because IOM makes the recommendations. Governments have to come up with policy changes. In other words, you've got some of the policy questions here. Should foods be or, uh, uh, fortified with vitamin D? Should governments advise supplementation with vitamin D? Which, by the way, Canadian government Food Guide does say you should supplement with vitamin D because Canadian foods don't have enough. So governments have to implement Institute of Medicine guidelines. And Institute of Medicine guidelines are things that are super conservative. And therefore, I can understand the phobia or the tendency to look on everything bad. When we went to discussions in Washington, Institute of Medicine people said, well, basically, think about guidelines the following. What do you do for yourself? What does a doctor do for his or her patient? Those are different kinds of decisions than what an institute of medicine has to do. Because institute of medicine has government implications for the whole of society, affects the food industry, and what they do in you know, institutional care. Okay? So what I would have liked to see was the institution of medicine, institute, IOM, be more honest in terms of its guidelines to say this is something that affects health policy on a long-term, wide-scale basis. But then you had this fellow Clifford Rosen writing in New England Journal of Medicine just a couple of weeks ago saying, case report, patient, 51 nanomoles per liter a woman. Should I be concerned? What should we do? Conclusion, nothing. She's wonderful. And for that, as medical evidence and guide is wrong because I know for certain, and I know people that have tried it, if you wanted to do a, an osteoporosis clinical trial, and you've got your treatment arm, whether it's a new bisphosphonate or whatever, and you've got a placebo group, you would not have ethical approval to have a placebo group that had a 25 hydroxy less than 75 nanomoles per liter. In other words, in a clinical trial, it's unethical to run the placebo arm with less than 75, and then along comes the government says, well, 51 is perfectly fine. This is, there's an inconsistency and I think almost a, a slippery scale that the Institute of Medicine came because they came in ostensibly saying we're providing guidance for society. They published that guidance on November 30th and then January come out in New England Journal giving guidance to physicians. Inconsistent and wrong. And that, I, if I have an anger in me, it's this kind of a two-facedness. If they were to say, these are guidelines for the general public, not for physicians, that would be acceptable. But doctors are having a hard time. I know ethics review committees to do research are having a hard time, you know, giving decent doses. So it's complicated. Just for you to be aware that um, the Endocrine Society has put together a practice guidelines committee. I happen to chair it. And in about two months, those recommendations are going to be coming out, and it's going to be, in fact, for physicians. So please stay in touch. Um, they may be a little bit different than what the Institute of Medicine is recommending. Mm -hmm. are, you, are you getting pushback about your recommendations differing from the IOM? Um, not too much could be said, but what I can say is that they will be different and that you are correct that there has been some pushed back by certain societies, uh, unfortunately, that had agreed to participate and yeah. now have no longer decided to do so. Yeah, I was on, I, I am on a group from the American Geriatric Society, which has similar problems. You go to all the trouble reviewing the medicine and the evidence, 
come up with the advice, you put it out for review, out comes the IOM which says something different, and then doctors being driven by things that are set for a different purpose than patient care. 